Bowing to criticism, America Online dumps a plan to hand over members' phone numbers to telemarketers. The company had planned to give the home phone numbers of more than 8 million of its users to selected telemarketers. Privacy advocates slammed the plan as an invasion of privacy. Dr. Audrey Gusky from Duquesne University says name tossing happens all the time. As consumers, if you're filling out applications, you're filling out different forms, they are, you're in a sense giving a legitimate license for these manufacturers, for these companies to take your information and to sell it and give it to other people. America Online already rents out its members' names and mails addresses to marketers. The city's recent conventions are bringing in the bucks. Experts say the NAACP convention brought millions of dollars to Pittsburgh. The goal? To keep them coming. Conventions boost the city tax base and place more money into circulation. A marketing expert tells us Pittsburgh needs to work on image to keep conventioners business. Have people come in and, and view the beauty of the rivers and the beauty of the people and the friendliness and, and the wonderful uh, activities that we have to offer. I think that's what, what uh, Pittsburgh needs to do in order to market itself. When comparing Pittsburgh to Cleveland, Dr. Gusky says Cleveland wins more conventions because of lakeshore development, a new stadium, and venues like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Today, the Food and Drug Administration cleared the way for those new advertisements. Channel 11's Chris Long is in the newsroom to give us more details on this. Chris? Peggy, I think many of our viewers will agree. When you see a television advertisement now for a prescription drug, it can be rather mystifying, to say the least. Many times you'll see something like a smiling allergy sufferer walking through a wheat field, and then the announcer comes on and says, if you want more information about this drug, ask your local physician. One reason for this is that the FDA in the past has always required that the companies making these prescription drugs list all of the potential side effects. Well, the FDA has made a change. Now only major side effects need to be listed. What is going this mean for the consumer? Well, we asked a local marketing professor about that today. By decreasing a lot of the regulations for the different drug companies and advertising, it's really open, opening up the competition and allowing us as consumers to know more and more about the drugs that we're taking, which is very positive news for consumers. And the drug companies also have the option of putting out a toll-free number or an Internet address so consumers can get more information on these prescription drugs. It is a rather significant change. Chris Long reporting live in the newsroom. All right. last night uh, and offered the North American exclusive for $250,000. We turned them down. We also put out a statement asking the world press uh, to follow our lead and to boycott these pictures. Uh, a message has to be sent. We were just listening to Stephen Cause, the editor of the National Enquirer, talking about how his paper will not print those crash photos of Diana that apparently are available on the world market. Right now we've been talking about the backlash against the world of the tabloids. Many blame those photographers on the motorcycles in some way for the death of Diana and now it sounds this morning as if one of them uh, could be indicted on manslaughter charges in France. But now there's a question, will that backlash against the tabloids turn into a boycott as people turn their backs on the tabs? We've been talking with entertainment correspondent Robin Carter here in New York City. And now joining me from Pittsburgh, marketing expert Dr. Aubrey Gus Gusky. Doctor, thanks very much for joining us today. My pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, you know, a lot of people are very interested in this. What's your take on it? Do you think people are outraged and they're going to turn their backs on the tabloids? Well, it's very interesting because even though a lot of consumers are blaming the tabloids for the death of Princess Diana, what is really going to happen is it's feeding the frenzy, as Robin said, and people are so hungry and starved for information that I think it's fuel for the fire. You can see a lot of the bookstores and the newsstands are selling out. Uh, they can't keep enough material about Princess Diana, and so I think that frenzy is really going to continue. The average consumer is not blaming themselves for this. They believe the tabloids are putting it out, and they in turn are just simply buying the material. You know, but uh, it, it, it's like the proverbial uh, truck wreck, you know, where you want to slow down, you want to look at it, but at the same time you know that uh, there could have been some contributing factor uh, with those photographers in the death of Diana. Yeah. This, could, this case could be completely different than anything we've ever seen. Yeah, exactly. Princess Diana was the most photographed face that we had throughout the world, and people wanted to hear everything they possibly could about her. She was a figure that was tremendously loved, a role model 
for a lot of young women. And a lot of the people who buy the tabloids are young women, ages 18 to 49. And you've got about 19 million people alone reading every week uh, magazines such as the National Enquirer. So this is a tremendous number of people that are still interested and more than ever interested in what actually happened. We do know of one boycott that is being organized this Saturday in Britain by an organization called Press Wise. They're suggesting that nobody buy the newspapers on Saturday because that is the day of Diana's death. And Robin, here in the United States, uh, we were talking just a moment ago about how ce celebrities have been talking about, you know, if, if you want these practices stopped, you've got to stop buying the tabloids. Well, people are, are supposedly outraged. The, uh, I mean, certainly the world is in shock. Certainly the world mourns Diana. How guilty does the average person feel who's ever bought a tabloid? Right. Some people are saying they do, but I think the way to show their outrage would be to boycott. And, you know, it's interesting. Nightline posed, posed a question last night. They said, if I sat here and said to you on the air, I've got a picture of the car wreck, and then I said to you, no, I don't have it, would you, would you the viewer, be disappointed that you didn't get to see it? Well, the natural reaction is you'd want to see it just so that because that's the way human nature is. And doctor, isn't that the way it works? Absolutely, yes. We're a very curious bunch and we really want to know everything that happened and see it, even though in reality, when you think about it, realistically, it does not make sense for us to, to want to see all the gory details, but we do. And we follow Diana's life. Uh, we, we've understood the problems and difficulties she's had and, and the crises that she's gone through, and we just believe this is another part, and we want to continue to be a part of that. As and well. we want to continue this conversation. You're watching Fox News Channel's Fox on Consumers. We'll be right back. Provided by paparazzi. Will privacy issues ever change if people keep buying those tabloids, those pictures? Esther Tro talked to a local marketing expert tonight. An anti-media mural in New York reads media overkill and portrays photographers as beasts. But as much as people blame the media for the tragedy, they are not willing to take responsibility for buying the pictures and creating the demand. Duquesne marketing professor Dr. Audrey yeah. Gusky. I think consumers are still going to try to justify it and rationalize in their minds that, well, you know, we didn't ask them to do it, but I really want to see it. It's almost as if you're driving past an auto accident and you don't want to look but you glance over anyway. And as a result, tabloids are sold out across the world and a record number of copies are in circulation. It's almost as if there's been a frenzy and it's been fed upon and so the fire has been built up instead of being extinguished. But a Baltimore group is urging the removal of tabloids of from tabloids. supermarket checkout counters and some the... chains are considering it. But experts say the magazine editors will need to make the change in their standards. I think it's going to have to be through the industries and the tabloids are going to have to be more ethical and moral in what they're actually purchasing and I think by doing that they're going to discourage the paparazzi. Esther Tro reporting now the question will the pictures from Diana's mangled car be sold to a record amount of people and how soon will they be released? Those questions still to be answered. Got a complaint about those Oreos, that quarter pounder you're putting down, even your AT&T service? Well, if you call their 800 number, you may not get the company responsible, but rather outside pros who handle complaints all day long. And the kicker, when you call them, they're collecting information on you. It's called inbound marketing, and it's one of our topics on today's Fox on Consumers. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Fox on Consumers. I'm Rick Fulbaum. Later on in the show, we'll find out how to make sure your family vacation is stress-free. But first up, the topic is call response companies, companies that answer the 800 numbers for other businesses and also collect all kinds of information about you. Here with more on what's being called inbound marketing is Fox News' Debbie Wilker. You've seen the ads, 1-800-CALL-US, about pretty much anything. Got a problem, a comment, from calories to cost, companies want to know what you think. Thank you for calling CSS. Thank you for calling Warm Set of Home Products. Thank you for calling British Airway. How may I help you? But more and more today, the phones aren't ringing at company headquarters. Rather, they're answered here and at other call response centers like this one throughout the country. Miami-based Precision Response is one of those companies. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 3,000 agents take calls for dozens of major businesses. 
They even answer the phones for AT&T. AT&T, may I help you? It's a booming industry. Uh, this industry has taken off, particularly over the last few years. It's projected over only the next two and a half to three years to go to about $18 billion. It's an incredible growth. Businesses that hire call response companies say they're not shirking their customer responsibilities. Rather, they say they're improving service. Clients such as DirecTV say they'd rather perfect their own products and leave the phone calls to the pros. When DirecTV started, they knew that in-house we didn't have kind of like the expertise to do the call center. So what we looked to do was outsource so that we could have that expertise through a third party. Thank you for calling DirecTV. My the agents aren't just there to solve problems. Problems, they also track which products are hits with consumers and which are not. At the same time, they're also taking callers' names and other information about them. Schools today. Do they realize they're they're suddenly becoming part of the survey or adding to the statistics? I think more and more co uh, consumers these days understand that companies are using data uh, to deliver better services and products to them. So the next time your taco's on the soggy side, remember when you call the company, you are on file. Thank you for calling Taco Bell. My my name is Melissa. How may I help you? In Miami, Debbie Wilker, Fox News. All right. Well, joining us now from Pittsburgh is Audrey Gusky, marketing professor at Duquesne University. And Ron Rhodes is here in New York. Ron is the general manager of one of these services, Rob Weber and Associates. Uh, Audrey, let's start with you. Why would a big company like AT&T need to uh, hire out to handle these calls? Well, they claim it's a lot more cost effective. What tends to happen when you're bringing outside organizations in who could perhaps take the calls from several different companies, it's saving them quite a bit of money. But I have concerns with this. There's a lot of ethical implications because when you have a lot of outsiders uh, being responsible for a particular organization, you may not be getting the quality of service and also the selling of this information or taking information from consumers that they are not aware of that they are providing to other people is a big problem for consumers. All right, Audrey. Big brother is watching. One second, Ron. We have just about 20 seconds. Should people be concerned? No. Um, what, what's, what's basically happening is we've seen the emergence of a 24-hour marketplace and Basically, these companies are really helping. I'm going to ask you to just hold off on that thought, and we'll pick up on it right after the break. I apologize for cutting you off. More Fox on Consumers after this. Stay with us. with more Fox on Consumers, and we're talking about companies that answer calls for other businesses, but also gather all kinds of information on customers that call in. Joining us again, Audrey Gusky, marketing professor from Duquesne University, and Ron Rhodes, who runs one of these companies. It's called Ron, Rob Weber and Associates. And, and uh, Ron, I had to cut you off before, and I'm sorry about that. Why shouldn't we be concerned when we think we're calling one place, we're actually calling another place, and there might be information gathered about us and given out to people that we might not want to have that information? Well, well first of all, it's Ron Weber and Associates. Okay, I'm sorry um, about that. No problem. And um, what, 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 is, what essentially has taken place is that we've seen the emergence of a 24-hour consumer marketplace. And we recognize that business relationships are, are essentially trust-based, but it's very healthy for our economy to ha for, for these corporations to be able to share such services so that they can offer more to the consumer. But you don't tell people that are calling in, first of all, that they're not talking to the people that they think they're talking to, and second of all, that, that you're taking down some personal information about them that you're going to share with other people. Isn't that deception? We don't de deliberately deceive anyone. We don't necessarily volunteer this information, but if any consumer calls any of our agencies and asks whether they're talking directly to that company, we'll, we'll be very forthcoming with that information. But, but you're really dealing with an issue of privacy here. As consumers, we have a right to know where our information is being sent. If someone has a medical problem, they don't want insurance companies and potential employers to find out about different types of uh, problems they may have. As consumers, we have a right to know where that information is going out. And we should be told. As, as a consultant, I've worked with many organizations and helped them build these call centers. And what we attempt to do is provide, um, gather the information to help these companies better produce products and services that are of interest to the consumer and will satisfy their needs. But when you're taking it a step further and selling that information to other organizations without the consent of the consumer, that's wrong and that's I, scary. I wouldn't want to mislead the audience here, Audrey. 
Um, we're simply a conduit, and we're, we're under contract by, by various corporations, and we don't keep any of the information. It goes straight through us to the, the original corporations that the uh, public thinks that they're doing business with. So That's we don't sell that information independent of the corporation that, that we're contracted with. Right, and exactly, Ron. And I'm not accusing you of doing that, but a lot of organizations are actually doing that, selling this information. And as consumers, we're completely unaware of that. We're providing this information. We're calling with a complaint. We're trying to get a new credit card. We're asking information about a product. And suddenly, they're asking us questions. And as innocent consumers, we're providing that information. Lou Harris did a survey a couple of years ago and found that majority of consumers are aware that this is happening but feel extremely uncomfortable with this and really don't know what to do about it. I think I would push that responsibility to the corporations who contract with us to determine the ethics and the values of, of the corporation that they're contracting with. We're very proud of our reputation in, in the industry, and as I said, um, we have no reason or desire to hold on to this information and do anything deceptive with it. Audrey, uh, we're, we're under a minute now until the end of this segment, but what can we do if we are uncomfortable like the survey says we are, what can we do about well, it? Well, I think consumers need to be aware whenever they are providing information, whether it's over the phone or answering some kind of uh, questionnaire, that information most likely will be provided to someone else and outsourced to someone. They're creating databases and warehouses. They know who we are, they know where we live, they know what's important to us, what we like to do, and and in a lot of ways, it's very positive because it's getting us better products and services. That's correct. Okay, well, I want to thank both of our guests, Ron Rhodes here in New York, Audrey Gusky in Pittsburgh. We appreciate Thanks. your time. Before you pack your bags and go on a holiday with the family, we have some tips for you. Stick with us. Tonight, a department store closing with jobs in jeopardy. Over 30 years of shopping tradition set to close in Pittsburgh. Katie Sesney joins us now with the latest on the closing of two Pittsburgh Lazarus stores. Katie? In all five stores are slated to close. Erie and Dayton, Ohio are losing retail. Two here in the Pittsburgh area. Lazarus representatives say the Beaver Valley and Greengate Mall locations have seen their last days. The Beaver Valley Mall location is one of two Lazarus stores in the Pittsburgh area to close in 1998, putting 174 employees out of jobs. The culprit? Competition. A lot of the department stores aren't doing as well as the discount stores or some of the outlets. People are looking for value. They're trying to save money. Beaver County being, is a good area, but it's, uh, you know, people want the best for their buck. Surrounding stores have mixed reactions about their future when the anchor jumps ship. Jason Bryant is confident they'll weather the storm. This is a mall. It's a business. They're going to replace it as fast as possible. But customers aren't taking the news quite so well. Shocked. We shop here a lot. Sherry Quinn's a loyal Lazarus customer. She'll drive an hour away to shop and says the mall's in big trouble. They won't come at this end anymore. There's nothing else else up here. The Greengate Mall store in Westmoreland County will also close. Regional Vice President Mal Roseman was unavailable for an on-camera interview, but says the location of the retail outlet is its biggest problem. Lazarus stores in Pittsburgh have had their shares of ups and downs since they took over Horns. When Lazarus came in in their place, I think to a lot of Pittsburghers, that transition never really happened in their mind. Lazarus needs to establish some kind of image or reputation and that's exactly what Lazarus will try to do when it opens its new downtown location at 5th and Wood Streets. Vice President Mal Roseman says they're confident that the state-of-the-art retail store will be a success the second time around. John? Goods. Katie Sesney joins us now live with the latest. Katie? Thanks, Carolyn. Well, only 13 shopping days and counting. If you haven't got it now, you'd better get moving. And that's what retailers are hoping. The sparkle season kicked off holiday shopping with a bang, attracting more than 50,000 people into downtown Pittsburgh. And the volume has remained high, but are shoppers looking or buying? Yes, they are buying. They are buying. I, I think you're going to notice lots of shopping bags. And the attraction has caused a chain reaction, lending a hand to neighboring retail. If Kaufman's is doing well, it's probably a good indication that all the other stores are doing well. Yes, they are buying things. Uh, our Saturday business has increased and uh, the people are actually spending money. It has been a late season. Uh, Christmas is creeping up on people. Surprising, since consumer spending is cautious this holiday season. The indication is that the season may not be as healthy as originally had been um, projected by a lot of economists. 
But retailers are optimistic. With less than two weeks to go, they could be in for their busiest days. It would be nice to say that consumers are smart and they're waiting to the last minute because they want the bargains. I think it's a lot of procrastination. Businesses give credit to the sparkle season, good weather, and a lot of activities. The group has made lots of reasons to come back downtown. So far, a thumbs up for downtown Pittsburgh. But some say we still have a ways to go. Downtown life it still needs a lot of, of spark to it. Uh, it's getting healthier, but it's really got a long way to go. So no official word yet on how the sparkle season has affected downtown sales. The Pittsburgh Downtown Partnership says there's still plenty of activities to come. Carolyn? Mm -hmm. have been such a bad thing after all. We're live tonight with Dollar Bill. And from the North Pole to our own North Side, proof tonight that Santa Claus really reads all of his mail. And Allegheny County's next DA getting ready to take office. Plus, more loving means, as they say, more living. New research on sex. And it's a Berg thing, an iceberg thing. Titanic hits town all right now. You're watching KDK TV News at 5. It's just a mind teaser, you know? It's just playing me for all it's worth. Friday before Christmas, the on sale signs are everywhere, but is it the real thing? Good evening, everyone. Just five shopping days left now. Stores pulling out all the stops for a big last-minute promotional blitz. And as they say on Yes, Virginia, money editor Bill Flanagan says many of the discounts are real, and he reports on the story. The cash registers aren't ringing quite as fast as many retailers would like, and so these have become the real signs of this holiday season. 20%, 30%, even 50% off. You wait more this year, or you find you shop later, or you're just typically behind? Just typically behind. Yeah. Typically behind. There's not a strategy then. No, it's not. <laughs> no, there's no rhyme nor reason to it. It's just happening. Well, I thought that if I shopped last minute, that uh, maybe I might get some bargains last minute. Is it paying off? Oh, yeah. yeah. I just come back from uh, one of the stores now, and I did pretty good. It's not your imagination. Many retailers stocked up for a bigger year than 1997 is turning out to be. And a number of new retailers have moved into the Pittsburgh market, taking a piece of that slow-growing pie. Peter Mendoza is vice president and group store manager for Lazarus. I think it's a combination of things. I think the new stores are certainly a factor. But I also think that um, our customers are looking for more value. And in order to entice our customer to shop in a department store as opposed to a catalog or off of TV, we need to entice them with, uh, with, with value. In recent years, waiting for last-minute bargains was risky since certain items sold out. This year, it seems to be the best of both worlds for procrastinators. Audrey Gusky is on the marketing faculty at Duquesne University. The inventories were pretty high, and uh, the sales weren't as strong. So for consumers, I think by waiting to the last minute was a good thing this year. Well, there's every reason to believe that this kind of competition will continue on into next year. Newcomers like Kohl's and the so-called big box stores like Best Buy are putting additional pressure on the existing retailers, the established retailers, and they're planning to add more stores in the Pittsburgh market next year. And, of course, as they fight for a piece of that pie, shoppers stand to benefit. Yeah, we like to have that happen to us, definitely, Bill. Bill, if the market here is really not growing so quickly, and we keep hearing that it is not, why are new retailers coming here? Well, it basically it comes down to the fact that they've saturated every other market in the country. The more attractive, the faster-growing markets, the best buys, the bed baths, and beyond already have a presence there. Pittsburgh, in a sense, up until very recently, was under-retailed. So the national retailers have caught on to that. They're setting up shop here. And as a result, we're getting a much more competitive market in Pittsburgh than we've had in past years. And again, that's good news. Sure. I'm here to guide his way. Fox News starts now. WPGH-TV, Pittsburgh. This is the Fox 53 10 o'clock news. Fighting crowds, tackling bargains, wrapping presents, the joys of the holidays are here. First on Fox, the hustle and bustle begins. Good evening, I'm Jay Harris. Leslie Pallotta has tonight off. Three shopping days left until Christmas and people are scurrying to get their presents bought. At Monroeville Mall, parking lots are full as shoppers got an early start to beat the crowd. Cars had to loop the lot a couple of times before finding spots. Same story at Great Southern Shopping Center. Lots are full as shoppers go about doing their business. Fox reporter Mary Ravazio did some shopping today at Ross Park Mall. She joins us live from there. Mary, is this shopping crunch a good sign for the economy? 
Well, Jay, it's, it's good for some retailers, but it's not good for all. This is the only Sunday night of the year where you'll find the Ross Park Mall just closing at 10 o'clock at night. Now, retailers are hoping customers will take advantage of the extra hours so they can play catch up with the extra sales. Be the registers are ringing and the customers are buying as the last few days of the Christmas shopping season close in. If you thought the day after Thanksgiving was the busiest day, think again. For American Eagle Outfitter stores here, the busiest day was yesterday. Saturday uh, before Christmas is the busiest day of the year, and it, it lived up to its expectations. And these four days before Christmas are, are going to amount to about 22, 23 percent of the entire month. Retail sales for American Eagle are up 10 percent over last year, but that's not the case for most retailers, according to Duquesne University marketing professor Audrey Gusky. It's been pretty slow this year. They were hoping for about 5 to 6 percent increase. At this point, it's only about 3 to 4 percent. That's below the national average. One reason, according to Gusky, is that more retailers are opening in our area. What's happened is there are so many more retailers and so many stores for Pittsburghers to shop in that, in a sense, the pie is the same size, but the pieces are a little bit small. One look around the mall, you'll see plenty of filled shopping bags, but most shoppers we talk to aren't spending much more than last year. I feel that I'm ending up spending more this year, a little bit more. Not much more, but a little bit more. With Lazarus and Kaufman's having their great coupon sales, I, I did really well. But uh, they had them last year, too, so I think it's about the same. And if you want to spend less money this year, that's one of the big advantages to waiting to the last few days. Many retailers put more items on clearance to move them out before the end of the holiday shopping season. Reporting live from Ross Park Mall, Mary Ravazio for Fox 53, 10 o'clock news. One of the malls right now with the story, Lynn. Well, Stacy, just two full days left of shopping until Christmas. And tomorrow, if you are heading to the shopping centers, you will likely see the crowds and you will definitely find plenty of people who are just starting their holiday shopping. Pressure's on, days dwindling, shoppers hunting for the perfect present. Just trying to get some last minute bargains, which we did. Thank you very much. All right. Have a good evening. But why deal with the last minute madness? For many, it's not about procrastinating. This sales clerk can sum it up in three words the big sales. Economists say retail sales have been soaring the past few days and prices dropping, especially at department stores. 3305. There have been a tremendous number of sales right before Christmas, and the reason for that is a lot of retailers really stocked up their inventory because they were hoping for a very strong season. That was not the case. So as a result, there's a tremendous amount of bargains still out here. Who are these last-minute shoppers in the stores? The last-minute shoppers tend to be the men. If you look around these stores, you can see a lot of guys shopping, trying to make their last-minute purchases. They procrastinated till the very last minute, and now it's, it's now or never to actually make the purchases. Now, even though men spend less time shopping than women, most women anyway, they spend more money in a less amount of time because they're going after the big ticket items, usually jewelry and electronics. Back to you, Stacey. All right. Making up for lost ground, stores try to cut their losses in what's been a dismal shopping season. Trying to put a little ho-ho in a shopping season that's decidedly ho-hum. Retailers are slashing prices on this day after Christmas. It wasn't supposed to be like this. A humming economy should have meant a green Christmas. So why are so many retailers feeling blue? Santa's throne may be empty, but certainly not the stores. Every time I come out here, it was packed. Can you imagine spending over your signature at the bottom? It's a bargain hunter's wonderland as retailers try to clear the shelves of boughs of holly. Tis the season where sales were sorry. Retailers are hoping that the after Christmas sales are going to be very strong. It probably won't be the case. They'll be doing some spending. There's a lot of sales out there. They'll be returning things as well. But overall, retailers have had a very slow, weak season, and chances are they're not going to be able to make it up in 1997. Which was supposed to be a very good year. My wife and I had a good year. We spent a lot more. Uh, I don't know. It seems like the the crowds in the malls, it doesn't seem like people had a bad year. Certainly not the market, which wobbled, but the bulls still rule. Unemployment is down, income is up, and so is consumer confidence. So why did sales disappoint? People were saving their money more than spending it, unfortunately, with the economy. They don't have it. 
but I think retailers are trying to bring prices down and to uh, accommodate the uh, customer. But profit margins shrink with each price cut or return. Scenes from a mall where disillusioned retailers wonder, where has all the money gone? And some retailers have sweetened the pot are offering discounts as high as 70%.